All right. Good afternoon, Michael. Hey, Ty. How are you? Doing great, man. This is awesome. I'm glad to be with you. Um, you know, I am an avid fan of your channel. I love the YouTube channel. I love the news, especially, and I've said this many times before, I don't even watch regular news anymore. I used to watch news once or twice a week or read yeah. news once or twice a week because I felt like I need to be informed and updated. Um, but honestly, with so much going on in social media and so much, you know, two sides of it, I'm really looking for somewhere where I can just get kind of like what's really going on at a very basic level. And what I love is when you're doing the news, I love how it's completely relevant to our industry. It's completely relevant and geared toward real estate investors, flippers, wholesalers, agents, brokers, lenders, kind of anybody who has any interest in housing or the housing market this is something to pay attention to. So how long have you been doing the news? So I've been doing, so the daily financial news started as a habit uh, about 20 years ago. I, I have an econ degree, was my undergrad and MBA. So I've always been interested in money and investing. Uh, but I did it originally just for myself. I'm an early bird, my wife is not. So I've always gotten up early. I've always had like an hour to, to 90 minutes by myself. And what I've always chose to do is read the news, what's going on, uh, you know, while I enjoy my coffee. And really what that allowed me to do is I was able to see what's going on with the consumer because they're my number one customer and competitor. What's going on with cost of capital because that is the most, that is the biggest expense I have every year, interest. And it allows me to adjust cash flow. So I've been doing it habitually for 20 years. Uh, it has turned into a daily show on my YouTube channel for over a year. I've been doing daily shows for over a year, which is great. People can go back and look at them and go, you know, what did he say on July 17th or August 15th? They're there. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. I would say you're pretty right. And I love that you. <laughs> I've had a good streak the last month or so. That's for sure. <laughs> you've been really spot on. I, I would say that it's accurate. And I love to, you don't necessarily gear opinions or try to persuade the audience of this is how what you believe is right. It's more so this is what's going on and this could happen or this could happen or that could happen. And I think this is gonna happen. And I love, I love the um, authenticity of it. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the accuracy of just fine points. And the show's usually what, eight to 12 minutes? Yeah, I would say eight to 12 minutes, yeah. It starts, to, and again, I do them live. That's another thing. There's a lot, most YouTube entertainers out there record them, edit them, splice them together. I hate that stuff. I will never do that. I do them live. I hit go at 7.30, right? I talk for eight to 12 minutes, done, and I'm on to the next thing, right? My entire show is 12 minutes, no editing, nothing. It's, I mean, one time I was doing the show and the phone dropped. I'm like, whoops, I guess the phone dropped. I'll just prop it back up and keep going. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So anyway, so for a lot of you that don't know, please tune into Michael's channel. I've talked about it many times before, but I can tell you, even just for daily news, especially for our industry, if you're interested in housing, the market, what's going on in the economy as it relates to the market, and I think, too, just generally what's going on, I think it's great news channel. So let's talk about, you did a great video, man, and I got to say that um, the timing of it, we're in the fourth quarter now. We're basically, it's October 16th today that we're recording this, 2020, yeah. and specifically, like, you did an awesome video, and I believe the title of the video, if you have not seen the video yet, for some of you that may be new to Michael's channel, the video is called How to Create Joy and Create Good Karma, or the essence of it. What is the title, Michael? One it's How to Create Joy, Leverage a Teaching Moment, and Create Good Karma. I love it. And so Michael had mentioned it on one of the other podcasts or one of the other broadcasts. And I'm like, hey, if Michael mentioned it. I'm going to listen to it. I like, you know, I, I want to create more joy. Right? So. <laughs> You know, I listened to it and I had no idea where you were going with it. And, I, and I'm going to throw it as a teaser to the audience, how incredible it is and how um, personally, not only did I connect with it from, you know, growing up in my childhood and, you know, and obviously you share a lot of personal and intimate things about your childhood and growing up and your family. And it's a nice short little video that I think will really help you get grounded. But as Michael said, create, create more joy and good karma. Talk a little bit more about it. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate the, the shout out for that. Uh, I do a lot of videos every day and that one video, I think it's 12 minutes long is probably the most important video I've ever done. 
So this is how it happened. And I say ever done, like from the very first show, it's the most important video I've ever done because this is how it, this is how it starts, right? And I'm clear with my audience. So I put out a video, a daily news saying that I think Christmas is canceled. I think we're in a K-shaped recovery. If you're on the top of the K, you're gonna do fine. But if you're on the bottom of the K, Christmas is canceled. And that's a horrible feeling. I did not like saying that, right? And you know, I've been pretty clear on my show. My mother still watches every episode I put out. So shout out mom. But she reached out to me like she's known to do and her simple text was, all right, boy, what are you gonna do about it? I'm like, shit, <laughs> my mom's calling me out. <laughs> so I, uh, I thought about it for a while and what we could do, cause you know, I could write a check and, and you know, be okay about it, but that's not enough. I wanted to take this audience, which now is numbers over 10,000. We just crossed that mark and see what we can't do as an audience, right? The one rental at a time family. So I created a honest, and like you said, I shared some personal stories in there about one Christmas that was canceled in my family. And, you know, I, I sort of closed with, you know what? My mom has been doing Toys for Tots for seven years now, right? She's always been a very giver and leading by example. And she challenged me. So I did some research, found out what county she's in, right? East Madera, if memory serves, it's in the video. I found the address uh, that you could send checks to, which is uh, the Marines, right? Toys for Tots, but it's in the video and a link to, to donate. And I challenged my audience. I'm like, okay, folks, it's October. You can plan to make a donation. Most of the people watching my channel can donate 20, 100 or more. And again, you can plan for it, right? I'm not coming to you like G December 15th when you've already sprint, spent all your Christmas money. And I, you know, my hope is, and, and it looks like we've, we're already up to about $1,000 in donations with what you were gracious enough to put out there. And it's a really good feeling. And um, I'm gonna keep talking about it throughout the month of October because it, you know, it, there's nothing like it. And, and what I mean by teaching moment. So first off, creating joy, right? There's three sections of the video, creating joy. There is nothing I like better than seeing a kid smile. Historically, my holiday was Halloween, right? Because Christmas for me is family. And yeah, you know, I can make my family smile. But Halloween always gave me a chance to grab just a handful of candy and like be that one crazy neighbor who like just through like 10 bucks of candy into every bag, right? I would, man, I'd go, I'd go spend hundreds of dollars on candy. And I was that guy. Um, but you're not gonna be able to do that this year, right? Christmas yeah. or um, Halloween is kind of tempered and I don't wanna be the guy that gets, you know, I just, it's just different this year. So, uh, you know, you can really bring joy. And if, if we can bring joy on kids we don't even know, I mean, that's, that should just, that should make you feel good. And then a teaching moment. Another big thing for me is I like to help kids and in investing in money and all of that. You've seen me, I've done book report challenges and given thousands of dollars away. But just think about it. If you're, if you're a mom or a dad, you have a kid and you could sit them down now and say, hey, you know what? Instead of buying you one extra present this year, you and I are gonna donate 50 bucks to Toys for Tots. Because again, there are gonna be hundreds of thousands of kids this year that don't have Christmas. Would you be okay if we took $50 of what you, you, you were going to get and we gave it away? Are you okay with that? Make it a teaching moment. And then lastly, good karma. Who doesn't think 2020 sucks? I mean, seriously, really? Let's try to create some good karma as we head into 2021. So that was really there. I, again, pour my heart out. I tell you a very moving story that I can still feel in my bones in the video if you want to hear it. Uh, it's there. So yeah, that, that video, How to Create Joy, is important. There's all kinds of links to make donations. And if you are one of my viewers or subscribers, tell me, because I want to celebrate with you. I want to give you shout outs. And Ty, I want to thank you for your very generous donation for Toys to Tots. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. And I got to say that for everybody, watch the video, listen to the video, just get connected to it. Because I think for anybody, I know for all of my friends and the family and the tribe that, that I vibe with and uh, people in other groups and so forth and people that were in uh, squadup.com and some of the other masterminds and such, I can tell you this will really shift your perspective. Watch the video and then more importantly, as important, take the time to really figure out how you're going to have some impact in your community. And, and, you know, and join with Michael and I in his community with his mom and, you know, her mission. 
So thank you for that, Michael. I really appreciate it. I love it. Watch the video, guys. Guys and gals, please watch the video. Yes, sir. Let's talk a little bit. Let's shift gears a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, I want you to explain something because it's interesting. I've heard a lot of people talk about, and I think I understand it. Um, you know, I'm a pretty smart guy, but I love you hear it a lot, so much on the news, and they talk about a K-shaped recovery. Yeah. I didn't tell you we were going to talk about this, That's but okay. I think it's important because we hear it a lot, and I think people kind of have an idea. Explain what a K-shaped recovery is. Yeah, so let's, so let's walk it back first, right? If, if go back, and again, this is why I love the daily financial news, because you can go back to February, March, and really talk about, people were talking about V-shape, U-shape, L-shape, Nike Swish. And very early on, you can actually research on my channel, K-shape. I called it in late March. And there's a whole video. It's a big K on my the thumbnail, so it's very easy to see. And here's what a K is. First off, the letter K is down. We all went down together in Q2. Q2, the economy shut down. We lost GDP was down, I forget, something like 33%, right? So everybody was down. But then the Treasury comes in. Then the Fed comes in. Then asset prices get inflated. Then the Fed lends and starts buying corporate debt and junk bonds. And lo and behold, what happens? We, su we start to see a bifurcation. The K starts to form, right? If you are on the top of the K, uh, that means you own assets. It means you own stocks. It means you own real estate. It means you are likely a white, white collar employee who can work from home. You can work from anywhere. You were not affected by being essential or non-essential. Now, the tragedy, one sec. Yeah, no worries, take your time. I get all these wholesalers calling me, so I gotta hang up on them. <laughs> yeah, I know, now, that's what I love. Now, just also sidebar, Michael yeah. is an active guy. I know I didn't really give him the proper introduction. We just rolled into it. Michael owns over 180, pro, uh, 180 doors, Yeah. all in California. The guy's an active investor. He's always got deals and stuff going. Oh yeah. Believe me, like, yeah, I, I do the daily financial news because I got I got tens of millions of dollars at risk. So yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. So I just want you to know, like, if you guys know me in terms of my friends and my family and the audience that I spend a lot of time with, this guy is the real deal. Believe me, that's why I pay so much attention. And you know, we're really I'm honored that you're you know participating with us and Absolutely. to have you and to be able to share you with our groups and masterminds. So continue with the K. Yeah, so the bottom, the bottom of the K, and this is where the pain is. This is where you were, and basically you were selling physical hours. You were in retail, restaurants, hospitality, entertainment, theaters. Lots of our economy is shut down. And those individuals are feeling pain. So that's really what has happened is, is if, if you were lucky enough to own assets, white collar, whatever, this has really been a non-event. You've probably saved money because you haven't spent as much. You're like, ah, feels kind of good to me. I'm home more often. Maybe I got a second home. Good. But you got to remember there's 20%, 25%, 30% of the folks on the other side of the K. And given the failure of Congress to build the second half of the bridge, which is that $2 trillion stimulus, we have a huge swath of our economy that is not doing well. So it's not a V, it's not a U, it's not an L, it's not a Nike swoosh. It is absolutely without question a K-shaped recovery. Okay, love it. Thank you for that explanation. So um, I want to transition to the next question. And this was something that, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about interest rates, mm -hmm. right? I think for our industry, I know that, you know, most markets in California, or actually we'll talk about suburban versus urban markets, mm -hmm. but obviously interest rates have been low because of the pandemic. We're seeing the real estate market, and I know in where I'm working at in the East Bay, Contra Costa County, Alameda County, Sacramento, Solano, the Central Valley, most suburban areas are red hot. Oh, low yeah. Inventory, low interest rates, multiple offers, you know, across the board if it's a decent property um, or if it's priced well. Mm -hmm. So what my question to you is, is about interest rates specifically is that I know in everything I've listened with you and read and, and all the news seems to be pointed that we're going to see interest rates stay low for the purpose of an overall economic recovery over the next three to five years. Is mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I would say the leading kind of best guess by most folks, including myself. And let's, again, I always keep to our industry. And most of the time we talk about 30 year mortgages. 
I think there's every chance the 30 year mortgage is below three and a half percent for four or five years. Pretty easy. That's not the only option, but I would tell you the best guess, the 60, 65% odds are the 30 year stays below three and a half for the next four or five years. Understood. Okay. And so, and I would agree with you. I feel that way too, but I wanted to almost play the other side of the coin. And then specifically, so I'll tell you, I started paying attention to real estate. I was born in 1971. Okay. I'm 49 years old. Um, my, I was raised, I lived with my grandparents as a kid and raised by my grandmother. And so I can remember like the late seventies, early eighties, um, you know, the oil, you know, the gasoline, it was hard to get resources. Interest rates were through the roof. And I can remember specifically, I can remember my grandmother buying a property and I was paying attention like in the office and, you know, staring at the realtor and how come they have such a nice car and how do they do that? <laughs> you know, like, right. Yeah. So, but That's I awesome. remember distinctly, I remember my grandmother being so excited because it was like, you know, the interest rates were like 14% or something or 12%. And she was doing a basically a sub too, believe it or not, but basically taking over a loan that was like eight or nine percent interest rate. And she just nice. was like, oh my God, this is a home run. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Go grandma. Yeah, right. Exactly. So what could, and again, I don't think interest rates are going to go into the teens in that, mm -hmm. but what could be a shift in the bond market in the, I know there's a lot of two interest rates. Yeah political climate, you know, if we potentially have a shift in the White House, if we have a political shift, if we have a shift within the Fed, you mm -hmm. know, what could potentially see a spike in interest rates where we mm -hmm. see rates maybe run away to four or five, six percent yeah. or more? Like what could, what could cause the other side for something to blow up? I think there are two things that could be, you know, use the industry term black swan, right? Two things come out of left field that truly cause interest rates to spike, right? Interest rates slowly ticking up over four or five years, probably not as impactful to real estate because you can kind of plan for, you do 30 day locks, you kind of work with that. But absolutely, there are some black swan events that can come out and you know, today you can get a 30 year fixed at 3% and literally tomorrow or maybe Monday, I guess in this example, they could be four and a half, five, six, or heaven forbid higher. There's two that I've seen. And again, these are things I think about. Because again, what did I say about the daily financial news? The second thing I play with is cost of capital because that is the biggest expense I have. So right now, uh, the US has the reserve currency of the world, right? We have AAA credit rating. And you can argue the fact whether it's truly AAA because again, we just the, the budget deficit just came out for this year and it's $3 trillion. It's a just ungodful number at the federal level. But that said, we still are uh, the reserve currency of the world. The first thing that could happen is for whatever reason, people lose faith in America. By people meaning outside forces, right? The rest of the world, right? Because right now, you know, the US buys or consumes a lot of its own debt, but not all of it. I don't know what the exact ratio is, but I'd be shocked if the rest of the world's not buying at least 50% of our bonds. Right, that is going to feed a $3 trillion deficit. So if for whatever reason, the rest of the world revolts, the rest of the world thinks we're not good, we're not credit worthy, uh, the, rest, the rest of the world just you know, loses faith or goes to the Chinese Yuan or whatever it is, right? Whatever economic event that we are no longer the tippity top reserve currency and we've got to pay nominal rates, boy, that would, that would impact interest rates overnight, that would impact the dollar we could easily go six, 7% and boy, the economy would crumble at that point. But that is, I mean, that's not, that the chances of that are low, uh, but it's not zero. Okay, all right. Yeah. Any other potential? Yeah. The other one that you and I really need to watch for, and this is a, this one, this one will take me a little while to walk through. Right now, when you look at the market today and we both said the market's hot, right? You listed all those suburban markets are on fire, but really, really, really what's on fire? is FHA buyers, right? That's really the market that's on fire. First time buyers, FHA, because the government is buying those. The government is basically controlling the 30 year interest rate, right? Basically, it's not private banks. It's not Wells Fargo and B of A, it's that. Because again, JP Morgan is latched down on, on criteria. It's harder to get a non FHA loan today. People don't understand that, but it's true. 
So really what is happening today is FHA interest rates. So one thing that I am fearful of is sometime next year, call it January, February, March, April, somewhere in there, some outside force, and it would be someone in the federal government, basically comes out and says uh, the, the forbearance period is extended another year. Something like that could really scare lenders, right? Because they've already agreed to a year, right? 90 days at a time. And they've been able to pass on the bills because the treasury was there to buy bonds and, and kind of keep the system limping along. My fear is if the forbearance period goes on another 12 months, banks are like, screw it. I am not lending to anybody anymore. The, you know, a 3% rate is a joke. I can't even make it make profit on service fees. I have to increase my loan loss reserve by 3x. The only loans I could do are going to be 9%. Because again, the, bank, the banks are in business not to be your friend. The banks are in business to make money. And this fractional lending environment is tough. The carry interest is tough when it's like this. So if our federal government comes out and does some kind of blanket statements and the financial institutions basically give them the middle finger, they can raise rates all by themselves. Bank of, there's nothing that Bank of America or Wells Fargo, they, they could do 30 year mortgages at 6%. They won't today because of a competitive environment and people would go elsewhere. But I am fearful that the federal government will overreach, do something very stupid, and all the financial institutions will go, mortgage lending is not profitable business at 3%. We are now going to charge 7 That could happen. And that would be tragic. Got it. Yeah, I could see that. And that totally makes sense. Is there anything else on interest rates that kind of in, in this topic? No, I think, I think though, I mean... It, it, you've nothing that would be overnight near as I could tell, but those, those are the two. I mean, those, I mean, literally the market could close Friday, banks could come in Monday and mortgage rates could be doubled. It could really be that fast. Okay. And then also too, potentially if it is a forced forbearance, like you said, for another year, that would obviously have to do politically that something's happening politically at a federal level or even on state levels, mm -hmm. potentially, right? Sure. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that actually, you know what, you just brought up a good thing. The state level, you have to watch that. I talked about federal, like it was all equal. If we've learned anything in this crisis, you have to watch the state. So think about this. Let's just pick on Gavin Newsom because he's our governor. Let's say he came out and said, uh, forbearance for a decade, just making stuff up totally crazy. I'm not saying he's saying that, but let's just say he did. No pay, no mortgage payments for 10 years there would not be another bank loan in California from any financial institution. They would pack up and leave. Right? Yeah. It's not profitable. Why would I make a loan when somebody could, you know, tell me they're not going to pay for a year? I mean, there, it, it could be that bad. So you're right. It could be state level. It could be state by state. And again, this health crisis has proved us the governors have more power than maybe we all thought to disrupt our economy, to call essential versus non-essential. And if they, pass legislation that messes with the financial market, the banks aren't beholden to, beholden to the governors. They, they, you know, they're supposed to be in business to make profit. They just, banks just announced earnings this week, right? Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. And some of them are good and some of them are bad. Yeah. Yeah, no, spot on. I love it. And I just want to be clear with the audience that we talked about some heavy stuff right now. This is not what we believe is going to happen. Oh, no. I'll say for myself, Michael, comment on that. Yeah, it's not. It's, it, I, don't think, I don't think these are likely. I don't even think they're, you know, I don't know what percentage. They're, they, both things we've talked about are possible. Yes. Are they likely? No. They're, sub, they're probably sub 2%, but that's not zero, right? Right. That's not zero. Right. Absolutely. And the key, I think, too, Michael, is like, again, back to what you said, and I love this. Like, so part of with Michael, he has a program, one rental at a time. And specifically, one of the things in the program that he advocates is really studying the market, not mm -hmm. just once in a while or once a week, but you're actually looking at your own local market once a day in the morning and then again in the evening. And mm -hmm. so I think without question, this really kind of emphasizes 
like for any of our audience out there, if you are in this business or concerned about this business, you need to be making sure that you're digesting, you're studying your market twice a day. You're obviously studying and listening to and getting good, accurate news from a good source, which I've already recommended Michael's uh, news mm -hmm. station. So anyway, I love it. Anything else you want to say on this topic before we No, no. Again, I, the, other, the last thing I'll say on this is I, nobody should get spun up uh, around you know, interest rates and, and right or left, liberal, conservative. Um, there, there's already too much stuff in the world that's politicized. Cost of capital should not be one of them. Um, you know, again, shop around. The chances of something, a black swan happening are very low. But again, things to watch for. Absolutely. I also love too, there's an underlying thread that we have not said, but I want to say it and get your comment on too, is that we're very, very lucky to live in the greatest country in the world. Mm -hmm. And that for what we do with real estate, the government backs the real estate. And I don't know that we've said that, but he, Michael mentioned about the FHA, also VA, you know, the government insured loans, the way that, you know, even with Fannie and Freddie, you know, the way that, you know, if you don't know about this, you know, most of the mortgage backed securities are in some way tied to the federal government. And so, because they encourage home ownership and it stimulates the economy and creates a lot of jobs and opportunities. So one more comment on it, Michael. Yeah, I think you brought up a good thing. And this is, this is actually, I believe going to be market moving for guys like you, Ty. I think the agents, people in squad up need to pay attention to this. I believe what we, what we have heard from, how do I want to say this without being rude? Uh, there's been a mantra of some big shot investors that millennials will always rent. I believe that has always been arrogant and incorrect, and we are seeing the proof now. Most important, we are seeing highly qualified borrowers that were legacy class A renters become owners in the suburbs. And man, if, if I was, you know, in your shoes or your team shoes or cold calling, I would be looking for the millennials that were renters in class A. I would, I mean, again, dude, I'm an aggressive guy. I would probably write up a form letter or something and go tape it to class A apartment doors and talk yeah. about, Hey, you ready to get out? You ready to go? Here's my number. Call me. Let's pick a, let's pick a suburb for you. I mean, folks, millennials, are going to leave class A apartments. This idea that they always wanted to rent was, I guess it was okay, but no, space is good. You wanna be able to paint it your own colors. You want a dog, you wanna have kids, you wanna, it's, it was a moment in time. And now with the big city shut down, uh, the, the, you have to be, your home has to be your office, your bed, your gym, your school. It's, dude, not gonna happen. Uh, there's a story of somebody I read in the Wall Street Journal that used to rent for 4,500 in Battery Park, New York. Now they own a home upstate New York for a thousand bucks. That family is better off owning a home and now they're paying for it. It's just, folks, if you want to make money being an agent today, one of the biggest untapped market is millennials. Go get them. Love it. Absolutely love it. That's a great transition too. So that, and this will be our wrapping transition point is it, let's talk a little bit about kind of the migration. We talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but specifically the urban markets versus su suburb markets, suburban markets, and just kind of what are you seeing from your optics, from your awareness? I know you're talking to people in different markets. You're obviously very engaged in your own markets. Let's talk about the suburban versus urban markets. Yeah, I think there's two things driving migration. And migration is going to be an important thing as an investor for the next decade, right? Where are people leaving and where are people going? Because what we are seeing, this is, this is almost like the reverse of the Great Depression. If you haven't researched the Great Depression, one of the things you could count on is kids left the farm and they went to the city. That was one of the things that you could point at and say, hey, the Great Depression caused that. What we are seeing now is the reverse. You are seeing kids, and again, I use the word kids generically because my daughter's 29, right? That age group, AKA millennials go, hey, this city living is not what I signed up for. It's too expensive. It's too small. The nightlife, I mean, Broadway is, in New York is going to be shut down for 15 to 18 months. 50% of restaurants in New York are already closed and another 50% likely to close. There are very, very little reasons if your employer says work from anywhere that you would stay in New York. 
So people are moving. So you are seeing dense locations. Think, think, think places with elevators. If you have to go up in an elevator to get to your rented space, uh, you should be thinking about leaving, especially work from home is an option. So just move. And then the other thing that we need to realize is we are going to have some clear winners and losers on, based on the taxes of the states. You and I happen to live in one of the highest tax states. It is going to get worse. And again, some of the places, again, I go back to San Francisco, they are being punitive to some of their people that live there. And anytime you pick on the folks with the most financial flexibility, they're like, I'm gone. Just go up and look at all the I'm leaving California videos. Started with Joe Rogan. Um, uh, Shapiro was next. Graham Stephan just did his. And they go on and on and on and on. And we are going to see millionaires leave because, you know, who wants to pay 16.9% tax uh, with less services and, and all these things? So uh, you as an investor need to watch that, in my opinion. Absolutely, 100%. And I would comment on there too that, you know, San Francisco is an example. I had a, a friend of mine, he's from Southern California. He sent me a deal in San Francisco, a house, mm -hmm. it, you know, a house deal, a flip deal, a wholesale deal. And what's interesting is that um, looking at the deal, you know, this is a neighborhood that would normally have an after repair value, probably 995, okay. you know, close to a million, multiple offer potentially and get 50 to $75,000 over the asking kind of let's go back to last year in pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, we're looking at the deal and, you know, we're kind of kicking the tires in, in the low sevens. And then even now as I'm talking to them, it's like, we might be able to do the deal in the sixes. But even then I'm like, I don't even, honestly, for me, I don't even want to do it. And then it's just now finding somebody that that might be a fit for. So it's so interesting how the tide has turned. And yet, you know, if I go inland, you know, and kind of let's say east, and I'm in the East Bay, places like Pittsburgh or Antioch or Concord, Vallejo, Fairfield, Vacaville, like the inventory people are just bidding wars on inventory. So it's yeah, I mean, I would do, I would not touch San Francisco today at all, frankly. I, but I would do a deal in every one of those markets you just listed. People are running away. And um, I mean, it's San Francisco has, a decade of pain. The next five years are all down. Then there'll be a bottom and then San Francisco will become investable again. And then it will turn around. But boy, the next five years in San Francisco, not good. I love it. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. Question though, you sparked an interest. What, how do you recognize that bottom? Like let's say with San Francisco, how would you recognize, how would you know that you're, or somewhere in the trough, we'll say somewhere toward the bottom? How would you feel that out? Um, there's a couple of things that I will be looking for. Uh, so first and foremost, I believe what, will, so first off, taxes are going to go up. Uh, they're going to go up in the state, but also San Francisco mayor or whatever it is, he's going to raise them. So I think what's going to happen is you, first things you're going to start to see is those will get reversed either through elections, i.e. replace the donkey who did it, and the next person rips them off. Basically, the cost structure is going to start to get back into place. Um, second, Watch employment. San Francisco has been unaffordable for a long time, but it worked because of all the tech jobs. So Twitter, Square, now Dropbox. All of these people are telling their folks to leave. They're shutting down their offices in the city. So, you know, watch them. Does, does Dropbox make a big splashy office purchase or, or whatever? So you've got to watch taxes and employment. That's the big thing. Because right now, downtown office is, guys, it's, it's, I mean, it's unsafe. There's tents everywhere. Oh, it's, I know I've been in the Bay Area 50 years, right? Almost 50 years. San Francisco was not a place you would go uh, in the 80s. It was, and it's going to get back to that kind of region. Yeah, I, I see that too. I see that too as well. So Michael, any closing thoughts as we wrap up? No, I, again, I just want to go back again, folks. If you have the opportunity, you're watching these things and you can plan to bring joy. To, to a child that you don't know, trust me, that is a wonderful feeling. Uh, I recommend Toys for, for Tots just because, again, a gift always does that. But it doesn't matter. If you can take a little means that you have and give a donation, the K-shaped recovery means we have a whole set of our economy that's going to feel a lot of pain. Christmas is going to be canceled for kids, and that's terrible. 
Uh, again, I share a story of a Christmas that I had to suffer through that. So, you know, let's try to, let's try to do some good and, you know, good karma will come back to us in 2021. I love it, Michael. Absolutely. Watch the video, how to create joy, how to, le or how to leverage a learning opportunity and create great karma. Watch that video. And I can tell you that it's going to inspire you. And I just, I know the group that's watching this. It's very inspiring. It's very, very inspiring that again, we have so much to be grateful for. I think in the case shape too, I think for all of us that are in real estate, if you're working, you're probably making pretty good money, you know, cause the real estate market has actually been really, really good for most of us. I think all of us who are really working and putting in the time, I know you guys are doing well. So with that, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to spend this with me and with the audience. Thank you for it. You got it, buddy. Take care.